The Morrison government has proposed freedom of religion laws, essentially protection from religious discrimination. And there's lots of debate, lots of conjecture about the suitability of the bill and the, the, uh, the ingredients in it for Christians, as well as criticism from leftists who are opposed to any kind of uh, protections against religious discrimination. They want open season, as they have been enjoying for a while. But is the religious discrimination bill good enough? We're now into the second draft. And to discuss this this morning, I have an associate professor in law, and we'll get into the details of the second draft and what else there might be needed in a final legislation in this episode of Pelo Talk. I'm an anti-feminist because I think it's oppressive, I think it's anti-male, I think it's anti-femininity. Now, it may be a very weak Brexit, but I'll tell you what, Brexit of any kind and leaving those treaties as well. That's the best yeah. ever interview. Yeah. Well, Michael Parkinson, you got nothing on this book. <laughs> well, welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello, and joining me today is Associate Professor of Law, Neil Foster. He has a uh, he lectures in law and theology, and uh, sorry, he has qualifications in law and theology. Welcome to Pello Talk, Neil. Well, thank you, Dave. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Do you lecture in theology at all? Um, no, not these days. Uh, in the past, I I used to, but um, it's a uh, law for me, uh, hundred percent of the time. But they do let me teach an elective course in law and religion. So, as part of that. I occasionally talk about aspects of Christian thought, but we also incorporate some insights from the general law and from other faiths and those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, awesome. that's, that's where I am at the moment. Well, as I said in the introduction, we've uh, seen a religious discrimination bill uh, first draft be released to Australia, which received a lot of criticism for really failing to do everything that it was designed to do. And some of the key um, cases in recent history in Australia we would have liked to see never happen, such as Israel Folau and Archbishop Julian Porteous, uh, as well as many others with low profile people, um, they wouldn't have been prevented by the first draft. Now, you've had a good look at the second draft and you've written a very detailed blog about it for viewers who want a more in-depth, meaty analysis of the second draft. I'm gonna put the link to that blog beneath this video so you can check it out. Uh, Neil, tell me exactly what were the problems with the first draft? Let's, let's overview, uh, I guess, the, the summary of criticisms um, that majority of evangelical Christians would have had with the first draft of the Religious Discrimination Bill. Um, yes, I think um, we want to start by saying that it's, um, the initiative is a good one. It's a good idea to introduce this law. It's filling a gap uh, that's been present in the federal sphere because there's been no general prohibition on discrimination against a person because of their religious belief. There were a few um, areas where the bill uh, needed um, some improvement. Um, there was uh, a a general provision allowing religious groups to live out their religious faith uh, under what used to be clause 10, um, but it was fairly narrowly limited in that it, it covered certain institutions, but it excluded any religious body that was engaged in commercial activities. And a number of us were very concerned about that, especially since some of the major uh, religious um, uh, bodies that interact with the community, such as hospitals and aged care facilities, um, would have been covered probably by the commercial activities thing and not allowed to operate in accordance with their faith. So that was a major problem. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, a provision that... Um, uh, said that you would not be sued for discrimination by making a statement of belief, but there was an exception to that provision where that statement was vilifying, and yet that word vilifying wasn't defined. And uh, the danger was that that could be extended to uh, meaning simply if somebody was upset or offended by what you said. So, which is a very that, low bar. Which is a very low bar, and mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, that was a particular issue with the first draft that had come out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, I think uh, there were some complexities around the um, uh, provisions protecting indirect discrimination and what uh, is loosely known as the Falau Clause. Um, yeah. That's still not perfect, but certainly there were some uh, a couple of issues with that where it didn't really seem to 
sit very well with people. Um, so there were, yeah, so those were some of the things, I think some of the main things that, uh, well, I, I, perhaps I'll mention one more thing now that I think of it, which was the definition of religious belief or activity in the legislation mm. excluded anything that was unlawful. And many of us were concerned that unlawful covers um, anything that might even have been prohibited down to the level of a local council bylaw. So you could have got a radical council that uh, passed legislation saying, oh, no one can preach or we will never approve, you know, religious meetings in council property or something like that, yep. which would then have excluded that, uh, you know, because it was unlawful, you couldn't have complained about it under the federal bill. So that was, that was also. Well, um, there are a couple of inner city councils that that would be highly probable, uh, not just possible, Fremantle, Melbourne, there's a, a, quite a few that uh, seem to be um, far left activist councils. Well, you follow these things more closely than I do, Dave, but I, I think from what I've read, I think you're probably right. Now, your blog identifies the changes in the uh, second draft. Um, why don't you go through those um, and maybe I can even ask you about them. Sure. Um, so the definition of religious activity, how has that been improved? So we're now no longer just talking about anything that a council could even prohibit. Yeah. Uh, how's that been tightened? Yep. And uh, you'll excuse me, I've got a copy here. I'll just look through it as we talk. Likewise, I'll be referring uh, to your blog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's always better to be as accurate as we can. So basically, the religious uh, belief or activity definition uh, still contains, uh, you know, still when you look at it initially, it says it only covers uh, activity that's lawful. Mm -hmm. There's a specific exclusion under Clause 5.2 at the moment which says that an activity is not unlawful merely because a local bylaw prohibits the activity. Uh, and their definition of local bylaw basically refers to um, uh, local council level decision making. So mm -hmm. that's an improvement. Um, and uh, as they say, I think even in the explanatory notes for the second draft, uh, it, it's inappropriate because decision making at that level um, is not subject to the same checks and balances as decision making, legislative decision making at the state level or the federal level, yep. uh, uh, where you can actually, you know, well, you know, clearly there are problems with uh, getting re-elected and various other things like that if you ban too much stuff. Yeah. So it's not perfect, but I think uh, as far as uh, improvement, it's certainly an improvement. Um, and the main areas where there was some concern about this would be at the council level. Now, uh, none of us, so I should hasten to add, no, Hardly anyone in Australia would say, for example, that where the federal law or the state law bans something like female genital mutilation or uh, violence against persons, we're fine for that not to be treated as religious activity mm. um, at that serious harm level. Um, there is still going to be a little bit of um, debate and discussion, I think, about some things that might be prohibited under state and federal law. I've had some viewers interact with me and in saying this whole bill is, is um, a Trojan horse and we're actually going to be completely legalising every traditional cultural um, excess uh, and evil from ideologies such as Islam, such as what you just mentioned, um, forced child marriage, etc., mm -hmm. under the definition of religious freedom. Fact or fiction? I tend more towards fiction on that one, I'm, <laughs> I would think, Dave. Um, look, uh, there are limits to protection of religious freedom. There are, there are limits that are set out in this bill. So, for example, uh, just to take you to something that I might not even have referred to in great detail in previous blogs, uh, section um, 28 of the current draft, mm -hmm. um, uh, refers to the fact that it's not unlawful to discriminate if, if a person uh, in in putting forward their views um, were counselling, promoting, encouraging or urging conduct that would constitute a serious offence. And so they define serious offence uh, within uh, the criminal code for something that's punishable by imprisonment for two years or more. Uh, and so someone uh, standing up and preaching that all unbelievers should be killed. Mm. Um, and Beheaded, you know, no, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to allow you to do that in my um, premises, where I, which I rent out. Mm. Uh, Clause 28 protects you and allows you to make that decision. Say, no, no, no. You, if someone's involved in advocating or promoting serious uh, offence, then that is uh, something that is exempted from the coverage of the bill. So um, I think that mm. some of the mo more serious concerns that people have 
uh, at that level are probably ac accommodated. So it's uh, fair to say incitement to violence, even if religiously motivated, will not mm -hmm. be protected under any draft, first, second or final of, of this religious discrimination bill. Absolutely, absolutely. That's good. Right. good. Yeah, now, so. just going back to um, the de definition of religious activity, you made a note in your blog that um, it may still be possible for a state or territory government to outlaw some religious activities. Uh, my understanding is that Section 116 of the Constitution has never prohibited uh, the states or territories from making um, religious discriminatory laws. Is that the fact? Am I well, right yes, about that? You're right. You're absolutely right about section 116. I'm just not sure where we're going here, but I'll just clarify this. Yes, you're absolutely right about the section 116 point. Yep. It doesn't apply to states. or uh, It doesn't apply to states. It possibly applies to territories. There's a little bit of arcane legal debate about whether that is the case. I mm -hmm. think it does apply to territories. But let's just talk about states for the moment. The states of Australia are free to uh, under the constitution, religiously discriminate or establish their own church if they want to, and those sorts of things. Yeah, of yeah that it's an important point a lot of Christians don't know. Um, and it's part of, I guess, the debate about why we may or may not want a religious discrimination bill. And that is that we actually don't have religious freedom in Australia, mm. um, not, in, not in a positive right. Uh, the you know there's the the law in the constitution that prohibits the federal government, the Commonwealth, from making any law um with with four different limbs and conditions and types of that but that in itself doesn't guarantee us religious freedom it says that just the commonwealth may not make any law about it prohibiting free exercise and making it a qualification etc yeah um, but um, a lot of us don't know that the states can make those laws um, now in this in this bill um, it's specifically leaving that window open for states to to make or prohibit um, some religious activities. Um, it is, it is, and uh, the bill's not perfect, um, and uh, we uh, we need to keep on uh, looking at it and uh, examining it more more carefully. So it's possible, and I'm still thinking about how to frame this, but it's possible that rather than just saying lawful religious activity in general, one could confine the um, definition of religious belief or activity by saying it's it's only outside the scope of that if it falls within that serious criminal offence provision mm. that I mentioned a minute ago yeah. uh, in section 28. So that's a high bar for yeah. um, for uh, for. And activity. let's face it, it is the state-based anti-discrimination and human rights tribunals which are the bane of Christian conscience in Australia. Well, there's been a number of issues there. I agree, um, but uh, yeah. So th there are there are still areas for improvement for the legislation in terms of considering well, what activities should be regarded uh, as outside the scope of religious belief or activity. To be frank, I, I I would actually prefer the Commonwealth not to include this concept of lawfulness in the definition of religious belief or activity because I think we should be honest. Uh, people who advocate horrible things against unbelievers are doing so from a religious basis. It's, mm. There's no denying that it's religious. I think it's a little bit artificial to exclude it from your definition of religious, just so I would think we should then say, having said that, however, your view is not protected under this act because of your advocacy of violence or harm and those sorts of things. So there's a, there's a, there's a discussion to mm. be had about how we frame that. But um, uh, yes, it, it's, it leaves open the possibility that a state uh, government, state parliament uh, may restrict certain religious activities. Um, and maybe it's a discussion for another day, but of course the most sure. obvious thing that we're concerned about at the moment is these moves against so-called gay conversion therapy, um, which may go so far uh, to restrict the teaching of the Bible and counseling based on the Bible f for someone who wants that counselling and it's a terrible uh, mm. proposal that's been put forward. So look, that that'll take us too far off our current debate, but that is an issue that I think needs to be needs to be looked at. I'm uh, I'm happy to I guess uh, divert just for a moment. Um, I on the issue of state powers, um, I'm a federalist. I believe in the original intention of the Constitution, and and that was to have limited federal powers and and uh, most power to reside at the state level. Um, with competitive federalism. Am I being a little bit uh, bet each way if I want the federal government now to take that power for making religious discrimination or the lack thereof laws um, away from the states? 
Well, there are some of our libertarian friends who would say you are being inconsistent, uh, Dave. I, I actually think that extreme federalism, just like extreme libertarianism, is unworkable. I think we need um, to have a, a mix of different checks and balances. Mm. And uh, no doubt you could probably get some more a very fruitful discussion of this from uh, my good friend, Professor Nick Aroni from, uh, from Queensland Uni, who's a very big um, expert in this whole area of federalism. We'll but, have to pursue uh, that one with Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think the fact is for many years, we've accepted that there's a role for the Commonwealth government. Oh, look, I'm, I'm not an, a federal eliminator. Yeah. Um, a Commonwealth eliminator. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And you're right. It's finding that balance. And and yeah. perhaps the Constitution, Section 116, needs an amendment to say that neither the, the Commonwealth nor the states shall make any law prohibiting the free exercise of religion or make it a qualification yeah. for government or public office or, or the other limbs that are... I'd be happy with that. Yeah. Well, the other thing to mention is that if the Commonwealth enacts... Um, protections that are adequate, then section 109 of the constitution means that that will override contrary state laws. So um, the fact is that there is the possibility uh, if we get good federal legislation uh, mm. for that to stop state governments, state parliaments uh, enacting laws that will radically undermine religious freedom. All right. Um, so that's, that's, that's how this legislation works. And there's a particular part of the legislation that explicitly does override to some extent state laws, which we'll probably come to in a moment. Let's move on to the Falau cause clause. Mm -hmm. um, so how has that been uh, fixed? Well, I think uh, one of the, uh, the difficulty in this area is actually explaining how the Falau clause works. It takes you about five minutes, but let me, let me do a, let me try a crack. 20 second version. Uh, so the so-called Falau clause is, is, is part of legislation, part of section eight of the act uh, or the bill, which deals with indirect discrimination. Um, and it's a situation where if you as an employer impose a code of conduct, which says your employees can't speak about uh, religious matters outside the workplace, uh, then they can argue, le legitimately argue that you're imposing on them a condition which is detrimental as opposed to um, people who don't have a religious faith. So mm -hmm. that's why it gets to be an indirect discrimination matter. And in broad terms, uh, the way it works is that there's a general prohibition on indirect discrimination, which someone in Israel Falau's position could use. Um, and then there is a more specific provision uh, relating to statements of belief um, um, in, um, and uh, it's dealt with at the moment in under clause um, 8.3. Um, dealing with um, employer codes of conduct. So I must say I've had a bit of a to and fro with this clause, but I, I, the way the government says that it's meant to operate uh, is that you can always use the general law of indirect discrimination, but the Israel Falau clause is meant to impose a higher standard on large companies. Um, and it, it only applies to relevant employers who have a turnover of $50 million or more. Um, and for those companies, uh, that if they want to impose such a, uh, such a requirement, uh, then it will be unreasonable unless they can demonstrate unjustified financial hardship. So that's the way it's ended up. And actually, I think it's not too bad. It, it, when you first read it, you feel like, oh, this is authorising big companies to discriminate against employees, uh, you know, where they can show financial detriment. But I think it's, it's, I think it's best viewed the other way around. There's a general rule that applies to everybody. You shouldn't indirectly discriminate against employees. Big companies with a $50 million turnover have a specifically more onerous obligation in that they have to bring hard evidence of financial hardship before they can impose such a rule. Okay. So while there's still some debate to be had, I don't think it's too bad at the moment. And Does the that other affect the public service? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, so relevant employer only is a private employer with uh, 50 million or more. So does and that the mean the government can, a public, a public employer, uh, a department uh, of education, for example, can place a restriction on the social media activities, for example, of teachers expressing religious opinions? No, no, because governments are subject to the general rules on indirect discrimination okay. under Section 8.1. So that's, that's why I want to stress this Falau clause is meant to impose extra rules on private bodies, but it doesn't exempt anyone from 
complying with the general rule on indirect discrimination. So mm -hmm. the general rule on indirect discrimination um, just says uh, that you're not allowed to uh, impose these conditions if they're not reasonable, and then there's a reason, uh, a set of a set of dis uh, considerations to be taken into account. That doesn't mean that these cases would always be decided correctly. Uh, it, this, you can't avoid the fact that you're going to have to give uh, adjudicatory authority authority mm. to uh, to some sort of tribunal or court. Mm. Uh, and it'll have to be discussed and debated, but it's. I think it doesn't. Uh, the, on in terms of sending a signal, the signal says everybody in Australia who's an employer is meant to not impose these discriminatory provisions on people. Mm. Have very good reasons. So, uh, if enacted, would the Rugby Australia Code of Conduct um, be, in your opinion, lawful or unlawful in its impact on Israel Folau? Oh, sadly, we're not going to have the litigation to decide that question. And um, I mean, obviously, the litigation wouldn't have used this legislation. Um, you can tell that I'm prevaricating. That <laughs> I'm how, how unlike a lawyer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely clear. Um, uh, I think what it would mean is that, uh, and, and this is this got, this has been interesting. To some extent, if Rugby Australia were to make out their case, it, and if this law was in force they would have to be open and honest about the financial hardship bit rather than fudging as seems to have been the case, you know, okay, mm -hmm. they refer to sponsors, but they have never given us any details about whether there was precise threats and those sorts of things. So the is the threat sufficient or do they have to prove actual financial deficits? Well, they have having, to prove that occurred. it's necessary to avoid unjustifiable financial hardship. Okay. So, okay. Um, the, there'll be a judgment just to be made as to how serious the threats are and, uh, all those sorts of things. So, and I think if you if you have to go into the public and say we're caving in because of threats from a sponsor, like openly admit that, I think that's going to be um, awkward and bad public relations for any organisation. Mm -hmm. So that may make an extra incentive for them not to do this sort of thing. Okay. Now, just briefly, I think it's, this is a fairly simple explanation, but the definition of vilification has been articulated as opposed to just a, a word which could be variously interpreted. Yes, it has. And uh, I think in a very good way. Um, I'm not just saying that because this is what I recommended in my earlier blog, but um, of lo lots of other people were recommending this. But in... Um... I'm sure it was yours that they listened to. <laughs> oh, thank you. So kind. <laughs> um, in uh, the definition sections, vilify, it says, in relation to a person or group of persons, means incite hatred or violence towards the person or group. Mm. Now, I think that's the right seriousness to pitch that le that word. Um, it, it, it's not vilification just to say something that makes someone uncomfortable. It's well, inciting violence should always be illegal. Exactly, um, exactly. But uh, that's, uh, that's not, yeah. that's perhaps, um, look, it might even uh, bear you, the expert, um, articulating for us what even that legal definition means, incite true, incitement of violence uh, in social media land seems to be if you make me think bad about you then you've incited violence ag against me well i think it's pretty clear that the way that, that the legislation is framed is that the word violence has the ordinary english meaning which isn't just make me feel bad or attack me verbally it's uh it's physical violence and incite means you're actually encouraging other people to do this to uh, to physically go out and attack people um there's a so I probably get the example wrong, but I think it comes from John Stuart Mill, who was one of the early writers in this area, who said there's a difference between uh, saying the corn laws are all wrong or standing up in front of an angry mob outside the house of a corn trader and saying, this is terrible, let's do something about it sort of thing. So the context here mm. uh, of inciting physical violence uh, is the sort of thing we're talking about and inciting hatred too. Now, yeah. again, we can have a debate, but... Um, uh, the question that you have to ask is, is this sort of thing likely to lead people uh, into hatred against the person you're talking about? Now, look, uh, again, there's no avoiding the fact that there'll be debates and discussions about that, but it's certainly a much better and clearer definition because the problem, just to reiterate <laughs> from the last, uh, the first draft, the problem with the first draft was that it had um, incite hatred or violence or vilify altogether 
in the same clause and it, with leaving vilify really undefined and, and open to all sorts of broad interpretations. So now we've def confined the vilification um, to this. And so its impact, for example, on the, um, uh, what we were calling the Thalau Clause is that there were exemptions, uh, uh, there are exemptions under the Thalau Clause for um, statements that, uh, you know, uh, have certain characteristics. And one of those exemptions is statements that um, harass, threaten, seriously intimidate or vilify another person. So again, um, we can have a debate about whether that's the right way to go, but it's an improvement on the previous one where it's clear it has to be a much more serious level of statement and directed at, at causing other people to have certain reactions. Yeah. Now, tell me about the qualifying body conduct rule. Yeah, so the qualifying body conduct rule, I think, is a, is a good addition to the second draft. And uh, as well as uh, this business of saying employers can't tell their employees what to say outside work or what not to say outside work. The qualifying body provision, which uh, I'm not sure I can trademark this, but I'm probably going to call it the Nagole Clause, um, it, it, because it's very similar to the facts of the case involving Felix Nagolo from the United Kingdom. Right. Uh, where he was, so he was um, removed from his professional social work course because he said something in his own time on Facebook about same-sex marriage. Uh, and now this provision deals with that sort of statement and it says that a qualifying body um, is, uh, is not allowed uh, to uh, prevent someone uh, as a condition of qualification of practice uh, in a certain area um, from, uh, you know, uh, not, not allowed to say that person, you can't make religious statements outside, outside the course of practicing your profession. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this, there's a little bit of complexity there, but generally speaking, it's designed to say uh, that you, as a qualifying body, can't strike someone off the books simply because they say something in their own time. So let's uh, bring it home to me. <laughs> um, if, uh, if I was a practicing lawyer uh, and I said certain things on my blog that uh, people were upset about and the law society, we got to the stage where the law society said, oh no, we'll will impose a condition that no lawyer can say these sorts of things. Well, that's mm. the sort of thing that's addressed by this. Um, <coughs> pardon me. And um, there are other cases that have come up involving doctors who've been disciplined by tribunals. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. Um, it seems fairly easy uh, for anybody in the world to make an anonymous complaint about an Australian doctor to the Australian Health Practitioners Association and um, regulators, and for that person to then get um, investigated because they take a traditional stance opposing, uh, conscientiously objecting to the taking of an innocent human life through abortion. Uh, would, would this have an impact on that? Well, I, I think it would. I think it would have an impact. Um... And uh, there's a couple of things that, that get tied up here, uh, which we'll just separate. Um, the, the, uh, the conscientious objection to abortion is actually dealt with, and other medical procedures is dealt with under separate clauses of, of Section 8. But in terms of the qualifying body, yes. Um, basically what it says, it, it, uh, if the qualifying body tries to lay down a conduct rule that restricts a person from making a statement of belief, um, other than in the course of practicing their profession, then that conduct rule is not reasonable unless compliance with the rule is an essential requirement of the profession, trade or occupation. So mm. you have to be able to show... Now, one can perhaps imagine certain situations where um, maybe your job, for example, is to assist with gender transitions and, you know, the employer says, well, you are not to on your own time, you're not to say that gender transition is rubbish and all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, you can kind of understand that mm. just as it would be poor if Israel Folau had used his Twitter account to say that, uh, you know, AFL is better than rugby and <laughs> you should, exactly. all, you should yep. stop going to rugby games. Yep. So th there are certain things that are essential as it were, that mm. seem fair to be linked with that, but that's a fairly high bar again. And so I think it's a useful provision. Yep. Um, and for example, it may have an impact as well um, on, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure, it may have an impact on universities and the way that they allow students to say things uh, in their own time as well. But I, I need to explore that one a little bit more. Now, the uh, second draft of the Religious Discrimination Bill 
has uh, clarified or extended protections to religious bodies engaged in, quote, relig uh, commercial activities, unquote. Mm. Uh, it has. So the new clause is Clause 11. Um, people who just got used to the clauses from the first bill, unfortunately, they've added a new Clause 9 now. So everything after that has a different number. But anyway, mm -hmm. Clause 11. Um, former Clause 10. Yes, former Clause 10. Uh, says, as a general principle, religious bodies don't discriminate by engaging in good faith in conduct in accordance with their faith. Um, I'll just unpack that in a second, but just in terms of the coverage of that, the definition of religious body has been slightly extended to cover um, charities that are registered public benevolent institutions. Now, PBIs, as the uh, jargon goes, are um, not every charity, but certain charities that have been able to satisfy the Australian Tax Office uh, that their activities are for the broad public benefit and receive tax deductions, those charities will be able to conduct their affairs in accordance with their religious teachings, um, educational institutions. Um, and then there's an extra additional couple of clauses dealing with hospitals, aged care facilities, or accommodation providers that allows them to make employment decisions in accordance with their faith. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a, a Roman Catholic hospital is allowed to say, uh, and they would have, pro most of them probably would have a range of people involved in various activities, but they may say our senior manager must con agree with Roman Catholic faith or be a Roman Catholic. And that seems quite reasonable if that's the, it's been run by the, that church for the, for the social benefit of the community. Does this so, discrimination uh, bill uh, potentially or propose to protect uh, any uh, professional in the wedding industry service um, who, who might be providing service, who wants to um, refrain from helping celebrate a wedding that violates their conscience? Um, no, is the short answer. <laughs> we, haven't got, we haven't got that protection. Yep. Um, I still think that's a protection worth arguing for. Mm. Um, this bill, and I just want to make this absolutely clear, this bill has nothing to do with sexual orientation discrimination at that sense. So the only relevance to that question you raise in terms of this bill, hmm. suppose you had a cake maker who was approached by, uh, uh, suppose you had a, a Muslim cake maker who was approached to create an Easter cake celebrating the divinity of Jesus or something like that, mm -hmm. um, and that person didn't want to do that. Now, I think that's the sort of thing that the bill ought to cover. Mm, that's but reasonable. At, at the moment, it doesn't. It doesn't cover that sort of situation. Mm. Um, and so that, I think, is, 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 another, is an area where um, uh, more work needs to take place. In my view, I think the government ought to be willing to say to people, and particularly, I mean, we've had this uh, discussion before, but particularly people whose business involves them spending artistic skill and talent creating um, things uh, that to require them to dragoon their artistic skill and talent into supporting a message they fundamentally oppose, I think is just, uh, is just not right. So, uh, but ironically, a, I'm, I'm quite surprised that there are libertarians who disagree with that, that argument that they believe uh, people should be compelled against their conscience to um, provide services that they don't want to. Well, I think you're right. I think it's a particularly astonishing position for a libertarian to take. Mm. Um, but uh, I, I don't come from that background myself. I don't take libertarian views generally. But a um, moment of I, indulgent comment. <laughs> I do. I do. I do support. I do think that we this bill ought to deal with what you say, but it doesn't at the moment. Right. Now let's have a look at something. I think that's uh, probably one of the best improvements um, to the second draft, in my humble opinion, and that is the definition or the the test for a legitimate statement of belief. Right. Statement of belief. Okay. Mm. Um, perhaps I, I can I just briefly comment on something else in in clause eleven that we have. Of course. Please. Uh, the clause 11 um, has clarified how you work out for the purposes of, of, of um, religious bodies decision making in this area, whether their belief is in accordance with their religion or not. And it actually contains some better rules than the previous legislation. Great. Um, one of them is that the conduct has to be something that a person of the same religion as a religious body could reasonably consider to be in accordance with doctrines, tenets or beliefs. Right. It's not perfect, but it, it, does it does make it clear that we don't want courts yeah. as such determining the reasonableness 
of religious doctrines. We yeah. actually want that to be done by people who share the same faith. That's right. Um, we don't get a and, homosexual activist, atheist judge deciding what Christian belief is. Yes, we should not. Although that's right, we should not. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> um, and um, the uh, the second thing is that actually they've extended this test into an alternative test which is to say, uh, now you don't discriminate if you engage in good faith in conduct to avoid injury to the religious susceptibilities of adherence of the same religion as a religious body. Now, that religious susceptibilities test, I'm very ambiguous about. I don't like the phrase <laughs> because I've mm. said... It's a bit patronising. It's patronising. It makes it feel like if I'm a Christian, I've got a disease or something like that. Yeah. But having said that... This Low is, immune system. I'm susceptible. That's right. I'm susceptible to attack. But having said that, this is a phrase that's used in other Commonwealth legislation, particularly the Sex Discrimination Act. Um, and it's been interpreted over the years in another legislation to mean what kind of what we would want it to mean, which is where you would do something that's against the, the fundamental beliefs of a, of a number of people in your religious tradition, then you, you don't have to do it. And in particular, that was applied in the uh, Wesley Mission case, uh, where the Wesley Mission in New South Wales were allowed under New South Wales discrimination law not to place children with a same-sex couple for fostering arrangements because of the application of a similar provision in New South Wales law. So I think the religious susceptibility great outcome. test is, it was a good outcome. I think the religious susceptibility mm. test is a good test. And uh, I think it does, you know, double whammy way, signal very strongly to the courts, no, no, we don't actually want you adjudicating the reasonableness of doctrine. We want you to defer to the good faith decision making of people within the religious sphere. Look, so, that's something that really offends. It, it, it is offensive about this entire debate, which we have leftist activists um, and even some liberal Christians um, feeling entitled and authorised to adjudicate what good doctrine is. It's like, whoa, this isn't your religion. Yeah. You, you get to believe what you believe, but you don't get to decide uh, or validate or approve of my beliefs, just mind your own business. Like let, let, let's live and let live like you've been asking for, for 50 years. Mm. Well, good. Now just stay in your corner and keep it in your bedroom because you know, free speech, you do what you want, but equality before the law means anti-discrimination for everybody, not just protected species. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, that uh, this question of deciding religious faith, what's 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 at the bottom of the concern, which is a, a germ of, of truth, is the is the fear that there'll be this sham religious faith set up where people try and cover things because of a, of, of a pretend religious faith um, or that they will say they're in a particular religious faith, but they'll take an extreme outrider view that nobody uh, really takes now, but I think those sorts of things can be dealt with by the sorts of tests that we've looked at. Um, and and in Sensible. fact, just to, just to make it absolutely clear, the courts around the world have said the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is not a religion. Exactly, <laughs> and it's the parody, and you can't use it to justify these things. Yep. Uh, and you know, the courts are prepared to say, look, in you know, looking at it in good faith at, at a broad level, is this something that's been justified under this faith? Would people from this faith believe it? And, you know, I think this is the sort of test that's now being applied, uh, or one would hope that that would be done in good faith, and that, that seems like a reasonable test. Yep. Um, now, we were, coming, we, were, we were coming to statements of belief, and we're probably running out of time. You and I could talk about this for a long time. but It is best but... to keep it brief for a lot of people. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, then again, yeah. some people do like the indulgent conversation that runs <laughs> off on rabbit trails. <laughs> Let's look at, uh, so, so Clause 42, as it now is, mm -hmm. is, is the part of the bill that um, says that a statement of belief in and of itself does not constitute discrimination. Um, the now, Porteous Clause. It's a Porteous Clause, that's right. And in particular, the reason it's a Porteous Clause is, is that Clause 42.1b explicitly says does not contravene subsection 17 of the Anti-Discrimination Act 1998, Tasmania. Now, that's very explicit, um, mm -hmm. and I'm glad it is, because uh, Section 17 is, is a unique provision, uh, almost unique under Australian law. Particularly, it is unique in relation to the religion, in, into uh, relation to the grounds it covers, the sexual orientation and other grounds that it covers, because it makes it unlawful for someone to say something 
uh, that merely offends or upsets, in effect, people. Ridiculous. Uh, it, it is. A, it's a ridiculous law. I think I'd say that with my hand on my heart. Oh, and arguably, the equivalent I, of "I'm telling mummy." It's just it, uh, <laughs> childish. Arguably, it is also unconstitutional. It's never fully been tested, but mm. certainly, there's a lot of serious um, reasons to think that uh, it, it impairs free political speech way too much. Of course. And, and you've got judges mm. in the High Court that have said there's no right under Australian law not to be offended. Offence is a part of robust political debate. Yes. So um, there are all sorts of reasons to think Section 17 itself is unlawful. Um, but this makes it absolutely clear that making a statement such as, and I'm sure perhaps everybody watching this video knows the case of Archbishop Porteous, mm -hmm. such as saying that the Roman Catholic Church's doctrine of marriage is such and telling that to Roman Catholic schools, yes. uh, that that can't be regarded as uh, contrary to section, well, it, 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 won't, it can't be sued on under section 17. Good. Um, and uh, then the other aspect of that is that um, there's an exception to that protection um, but the exception is now confined more, more sensibly to statements that harass, threaten, seriously intimidate or vilify. And the word vilify has got that precise definition now. Yeah. So um, I think it's pretty clear that um, if Clause 42 had been in place, um, then the Archbishop Claudius litigation in a sensible world should have been rejected straight away. Yeah. Um, and um, well, this legislation uh, is to uh, remedy the lack of sensibility in the world. Well, there's, that's one. That's part of the purpose of the law. Exactly. <laughs> we we have to uh, head off um, decisions that people may think are reasonable. That that our that's community says no, that's wrong. Yeah, and it's the activists that are heading up and making accepting um, cases in these judiciaries. Uh, not maybe not judiciaries in these tribunals and commissions. It's these presidents of commissions and tribunals accepting. Uh, frivolous, um, vexatious complaints that are that are the reason we need this legislation. If they were administrating those original laws in a even-handed, sensible way, um, that prevented them being weaponized for political purposes, um, then we wouldn't need this bill. But they have, and so we do. Well, I, I, I won't comment on individual decisions of tribunal members, but I, 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 I sympathise. I'm speaking with, broadly myself. Sympathise with, uh, <laughs> with your comments. Um, I think that, um, yeah, the, the law will say very clearly now. Uh, so it's, it's a certain protection. There, there are, however, there's still, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's narrower than it may appear at first because it covers discrimination, but it doesn't deal with um, other laws across the across the board which deal with vilification mm. um, so um, so so clause 42 1 um, a stops statements amounting to discrimination as such but concepts such as vilification on the grounds of religious belief are treated separately from discrimination uh, and there seems to be some doubt in in fact uh, it seems likely that um, clause 42 doesn't uh, assist uh, in that area, um, but um, so that's an area where I think it, I, I myself think it, it should be um, it should be uh, further amended to make it clear that we um, we don't want a, a mere statement of, of belief. Uh, do you think uh, that's self to do that? Do you think that's something the government could accede to? I uh, politically, it's very difficult, and of course, what it raises is you know there's a couple of third rail issues in australian politics and section 18c of the racial discrimination act is one of them mm. and and now it's not directly related to religious discrimination but there's uh there's some complexities around accepting this view um which will be attacked uh you know on that basis now look i'm i'm, I'm I'm a lawyer, I'm not a politician, and so people, others will have better judgments as to what might be accepted. All I'm saying is I think from the legal point of view, I would prefer it if Clause 42 also said a mere statement of belief itself does not constitute vilification. Mm. Um, so simply saying that the Christian faith uh, teaches that Jesus is the only way to God does not of itself uh, vilify people from other religions. Um, that's a thing that I think should be clear. And I think that's, again, even-handed. If the shoe was on the other foot yeah. and the Muslim statement of belief that Jesus was never crucified, yes. never, never a deity incarnate, never resurrected, mm. which are 
core beliefs to the Christian faith, mm. uh, we don't care. Like we're happy to have the argument about it. Well, well, of course, exactly. We want to have, we want to have, we want to have free discussion about these things yeah. and people from all faiths should be free to critique um, other faiths in a way that doesn't, uh, and you can do that in a way that doesn't threaten or intimidate or yep. incite hatred or violence. Yep. Um, and so we get I that, think what, that's what you believe. Let's talk yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Awesome. So top three things you'd like to see further changed in the final legislation um, that aren't yet perfect. Okay. <laughs> I'll try and remember some of the things I've mentioned today. Um, I think uh, this extension of clause 42 to vilification laws. Mm -hmm. um, I think the definition of religious belief or activity, if, you, if you're going to exclude unlawful behaviour, then set that at the serious offence level rather than unlawful generally. Um, you know, so you, that would be, I think, a better way of framing that if you're going to exclude unlawful activity from religious activity, make it very seriously unlawful activity. And so pick up the definition in clause 28. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was something else I mentioned, but I've uh, I've now forgotten. Um, well, let me add mine uh, in, yeah, sure. um, and that is that uh, freedom of conscientious objection, or what does it say, religious susceptibilities, um, that that would be extended to every individual. Right. Um, that yeah. if that's you get to you get to outlive your convictions um, with with you know i guess the word is discrimination you get to discriminate on what type of services you do and don't provide on the basis of good faith uh, religious convictions yes yes um uh, uh, as we know you can't use the word discriminate anymore because it's changed its meaning so much but we get it, to we get to prefer uh, that's just my judgment my judgment is that christians are on a losing a losing streak if they try and say Let, we, we all discriminate yes we know that we know what the dictionary says yeah i'm you know, trying to think of a better word for it i, I, I didn't like the word because it's been yes, weaponized and yes, emotionalized yes. Um, but i think thinking like choice or preference yeah. we should we should be able to prefer to uh, oh, liberty i i get to have the freedom yeah, sure. to not be compelled to action yeah yeah so i think i think you're right i'd add that to the list of um that that freedom applying to individuals because at the moment, the way that it's drafted, it, it, uh, it only applies to um, religious bodies. Um, and mm. uh, I think uh, there'd be scope for saying, well, actually, um, there should be a right given to individuals uh, to act in accordance with their faith. And perhaps slightly ironically, there is state legislation in Australia that already allows that in Victoria. The Victorian, believe it or not, the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act actually has right. a provision that says that not only religious bodies, but individuals have a defence in some situations that their action uh, was in accordance with their religious faith. But that's been very little used or relied on. But it's a model Interesting. that could have been, a, could have been adopted. In and the, that's uh, probably the point. Is it, is it was little used, little relied on. Uh, nobody died. Nobody suffered great indignities um, or injustices as a result of that being in the law. Yes, indeed. That's right. Neil Foster, thank you so much for enlightening us with, uh, with that blog. And I'm going to put that link beneath um, the article for viewers. Uh, I'm going to put the link to the article beneath the video for viewers to be able to read that in detail and just go over some of the, um, the, the thoughts that Neil's put down there with time to articulate it and, and um, explain it clearly. Uh, and we hope this interview has been of great use to you. So thank you for your time um, today, Neil. It's been a great pleasure to talk about these things with you, Dave. Well, that's it for this episode of Pello Talk. And uh, if you want to subscribe to my email updates, which usually come out weekly, head to davepello.com, where you'll also see past uh, video interviews and articles that I've uh, written. Um, and most of them are evergreen issues that um, need explaining. And uh, sometimes they're theological, sometimes they're purely political, sometimes they're quite opinionated. You'll also get lots of that as well as conversations on my social media channels, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and of course, Twitter. Just look for Dave Pello. And until the next episode, I'll see you in the comments.